Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is John Roberti, and today's topic is Why the Tech Lash? Antitrust Policy and Big Tech. We hear uh, much in the news about investigations, uh, questions about big tech and how big tech became so uh, powerful. But behind that, um, there's a, there is a story, and I think a lot of times we don't get into the facts. We don't get into um, into um, into the details. Today, we are going to hear from an expert about some of the policy issues uh, associated with big tech. My co-host today is Sergey Zelensky. Hi, Sergey. Hi, John. How are you? Good. Thank you. Uh, so today we're very lucky to have Hal Varian join our program. Hal Varian has had a very distinguished career in academia, having made pioneering contributions to the field of industrial organization and having published some of the leading texts on the economics of information-based technologies. Hal hasn't done too poorly in the business world either. He joined Google in 2002, a company you may have heard of, and has contributed to many areas of that company's strategy and growth. As the chief economist at Google and a trailblazer who has played a prominent role in the development of the data-driven business strategies that characterize today's big tech firms, Hal is the perfect person to provide some clarity and perspective on antitrust and big tech. Hal, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Hal, uh, do you think the attitude toward big tech has shifted significantly in the past few, few years? And if so, why do you think that might have happened? Well, certainly the press and politicians have changed their tune on big tech, but consumers are so, still very enthusiastic. So if you look at a survey, a recent survey from Georgetown University, the three institutions in which Americans have the greatest confidence are the military, Amazon, and Google. And according to a Pew survey from just a few uh, weeks ago, about 50% of the population says technology companies have a positive effect in the U.S., and only 33% say a negative effect. So this is not a grassroots phenomenon at all. It's a phenomenon that's uh, primarily from different sources. Why do you think there's this disconnect between what consumers actually feel about big tech and what some of the regulators or people pushing for greater enforcement think about big tech? Well, I think what's interesting about it, if you look at a list of, of uh, topics that actually do concern people, healthcare is right up at the top, there's jobs, there's the economy, there's all sorts of things that would be standard for consumers to care about. But for some reason, I think the uh, political establishment does, that really can't address those uh, issues effectively. And, uh, and so they're looking for something they can uh, affect. So what do you think are the most important things that proponents of more aggressive antitrust enforcement, uh, like certain uh, presidential candidates, for instance, are overlooking? Well, I'll tell you my three, evidence, evidence, and evidence, because you see a lot of very loose statements that are coming out of this, uh, this group. For example, Elizabeth Warren cites some data from PitchBook, that's a company that tracks venture capital investments, and that data indicated the number of startups has declined in the last few years. But if you look at the same source, the funding for those uh, companies, and particularly the funding per firm, have gone way, way up. And in fact, capital investment in venture capital in the U.S. has been uh, has reached an all-time high. It's never been better. Uh, so when you look at the data, you know there are these little sound bites that sound very persuasive. If you dig in a little deeper, you find a different story. So topics of startups uh, is an interesting one. It seems that many of today's most successful tech companies were either born or came of age uh, during that period in the late '90s to mid aughts. 
Uh, now, if there is a new Larry Page and Sergey Brin out there today with some great idea with the potential to shake up the world, do you think the soil is as fertile today for them to be successful as it wa- was back when Google came of age? Well, I think entry conditions are a lot easier now than they used to be, and that's because of the advent of cloud computing. So back in the old days, you had a big fixed cost, you had to have a data center, you have the hardware, the software, all of that stuff to get going. But now anybody can go get a cloud computer account and you've got this giant data center at your command and you can scale up or down as necessary from the course of your business. So the, we've got very, very fertile ground for continuing innovation. That's why we see all this VC funding I was just talking about uh, there's a lot of very attractive opportunities uh, in this uh, in this area. So switching to another uh, potential misconception out there, uh, one increasingly popular view is that free online services that big tech companies provide are not really free, uh, that consumers pay with their data. Uh, do you think that's the right way to look at things? Well, traditionally, economists had looked at advertising as paying with attention. So you have some compelling content. People come to your magazine, your newspaper, your website to access that content. And then you slip in a few ads to support the production of that content. So it really isn't so different than traditional print uh, publishing in, in that degree. There is personalization for certain kinds of things, but actually... In general, it's content publishing uh, where most of the money is. So content targeting, I should have said, not content publishing. Uh, Content targeting says you go to a page about bicycles, you're going to see ads for bicycle equipment, just like in the print world. So this is carried over online. It's true. We have a new component uh, now that if you're actively looking for a bicycle helmet, then you'll get ads that will... Uh, be related to that search, but ultimately it's not so different than what's going on before historically. So do you think uh, that some of the commentators out there are overemphasizing the importance of data when they look at antitrust and big tech? Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at it, you don't have to log in to do a search. You don't have to. You can do searches in incognito mode if you want. You can opt out of ad personalization entirely just by flicking a a switch. And if personalized data is so important, how come it's so easy to avoid? Uh, When you look at ad revenue, like I said, most of it is coming from the content targeting and keyword targeting side. And when talking of data, a lot of people use this new trope calling data the new oil. Do you think uh, that phrasing is accurate or inaccurate? Is it helpful to help us understand data, unhelpful? What are your thoughts? Well, I like to say they're, they're alike in one respect, and that is they both have to be refined before they become useful. A barrel of raw oil is not so useful, and just a whole this full of raw data is not useful either. So in information science, we have this concept of the data pyramid. You've got a pyramid with data at the bottom, and then you organize that data to become information. You make it humanly accessible. You analyze the information to turn that into knowledge, and then you internalize the knowledge to develop understanding. So, of course, that process, every firm, every organization is going uh, going through that. And there is an incumbency advantage. I certainly wouldn't deny that. Incumbent probably has better data, better information, more knowledge, understanding, and expertise, all the things that come along with being an incumbent. So when a new entry comes along, they've got to have something special to break into that market, typically. And what that has often been is technology. So take an example, go look at Walmart. Walmart knew retailing, right? They knew retail and they still know retailing. Along comes Amazon. They didn't know much about retailing initially, but they knew a lot about technology. And because they were able to master and utilize that additional factor, the new technology made available by the web, they actually have become a very important force in, uh, in retailing. So if Amazon used technology to disrupt the old incumbent, uh, Walmart, and break in, what do you think is the advantage that the future disruptors may be able to use to break in and succeed? 
I think it's going to be customization to some degree of trying to make things much more directly related to your interests and needs at the moment. We have this uh, thing called the Google Assistant. And I have to tell you a story about, uh, about Larry Page. He always used to say the trouble with Google is you have to ask it a question. <laughs> what you want is you want to just get an answer without having to ask the question. And that's what the idea behind the assistant. We thought he was kidding, but he was dead serious, and it's going to be a major force. So the next big thing, you won't even have to ask a question. You'll just get an answer <laughs> without having to ask. Absolutely. And you do the, it, what happens now to some degree. When you go to a new city or you look at a search for uh, air flights to city, you'll see things to do in that city, museums, exhibits, things that are happening. So... The assistant is trying to help you find the things that you uh, are interested in. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, some of the government uh, attention that has been paid to big tech. Uh, with global antitrust regulators adopting different procedural and substantive approaches, what do you think is one thing that U.S. regulators could learn from their foreign counterparts? How to provide better coffee at the meetings. So I think that's a big gap between Europe and the U.S. A very underrated component of having a good meeting. Any particular yeah. coffee you would recommend FTC and DOJ stock up on? Uh, well, you know, we all have our favorite, especially out here in San Francisco. So what if we flip the question? What if we ask what is one way in which foreign antitrust authorities should consider emulating the U.S. agencies? Well, one, I think, unique issue of the U.S. Uh, antitrust law and practices is that you have to be able to convince a judge that uh, you're right. That is, the government has to be able to convince a judge that there is uh, a violation here. Whereas if you look at Europe, the European Commission is judge, jury, and executioner all rolled into one. So I think the discipline that comes from the U.S. model uh, is actually comes up with better answers than uh, giving this uh, broad range of powers to the uh, uh, European Commission. And have you seen any change uh, in U.S. enforcement policy uh, where that discipline has wavered, or do you think that the discipline has remained even as uh, we've seen increasing populist te so-called tech clash? Well, I think the people, the people at the uh, DOJ and the FTC are, are professionals. They're dedicated to their job. They want to get the right answer. So uh, I think uh, there isn't been a change in any of those important dimensions. At the front end, of course, there's politicization and there's a lot of press and all this sort of thing. But I think the, the back office is, uh, is still uh, very hardworking and I think very uh, dedicated public servants. Yeah. So one thing that proponents of uh, drastic antitrust intervention frequently do is they compare the current large tech companies to some of the past alleged monopolists uh, like Microsoft from the 90s or even Standard Oil from the early 20th century. Uh, do you think these analogies to the past are informative in any way or do, are they completely off the mark? Well, you hear a lot about unprecedented size and power, but when you actually go look at the data, our current situation is not unprecedented in terms of uh, market size by almost any measure. So if you look at the most valuable stock in 2019, uh, Amazon's about 3% of the total equity market, but go back to 1928, GM was 8% of the market. 1932, AT&T was 13% of the market. And then 1970, IBM was 7% of the market. So there have been big firms before, and they've generally been big because they were the first or maybe the best to hop on some new technology, whether that technology was automobiles or whether it was telecommunications or whether it was computing. You had this, uh, this phenomenon that the people who were able to really master and utilize and perfect that technology uh, did, did quite well. And, of course, there's also been the failures. This is also forgotten. Look at uh, AOL, Inktomi, Excite, Lycos, AltaVista, Yahoo, Atari, BlackBerry, Blockbuster, Kodak, Polaroid, MySpace, Nokia, Nortel, 
Sun, Silicon Graphics, Xerox, goes on and on. There's a whole list of technology companies that were absolutely at the top of their industry with high valuations and were said to have a lot of uh, power of various sorts, but a few missteps and you're gone. So it's... it's a very competitive world out there. Just because you get to the top doesn't mean you can stay there. Absolutely. And in fact, it, it, it's unusual to see that. There, there's a nice chart. I can't show the visual here. But if you look at, um, at the leading companies by market valuation by decade, it's amazingly large amount of turnover there. Now, some commentators claim that DOJ's antitrust actions against Microsoft uh, have made that company very reluctant to do anything that could even remotely be perceived as unfair competition. And that it is this forbearance on Microsoft's part as a result of the DOJ actions that allowed companies like Google and Facebook to come in and thrive. Uh, what's your view? So I would say that during the 90s, Microsoft was particularly poorly managed. They missed a lot of things. They spent billions of dollars creating uh, the mobile uh, version of Windows and then were unable to get it deployed or adopted by other uh, companies and, and OEMs. They came out, they let Internet Explorer stagnate. I don't think that was because they were worried about antitrust issues. I think they were just not paying attention and were focused on other things. One of the problems with a big company is the, uh, the tendency to focus on what they're already good at and not looking far enough ahead at the threats that could uh, topple their business. Now, Microsoft is still in a very, very strong position. They were the most valuable company in the world just a few uh, months ago, and they're doing extremely well in their cloud provision because they've developed a lot of skill, knowledge that sort of I talked about before, that, uh, that allows them to deal with these uh, corporate customers that are spending the most money in this area. So I would say uh, it's not really the antitrust that created the environment. It was just some stumbles in the 90s, and they've recovered from those stumbles, and now they've got a situation where they're really uh, doing quite well. Uh, how um, – one question that I have is, is I hear – Sometimes people talking about breaking up big tech, and as a as an antitrust lawyer, I I'm, I understand what it means to break up a company, but typically the reason you would break up a company is because somehow the very fact of being big um, or something would, would generates the power. I, I, Talk about, if, if you could, talk about, does, does that make any sense at all in terms of, as you conceptualize, if you believe that there was a problem, would breaking up some of the big com tech companies be a solution to what those problems would be? Well, if the technology really involves increasing returns to scale, and that depends on, you, you can only answer that question by doing some careful econometric uh, analytics, and breaking up the company into two pieces isn't going to be helpful because a few years later, one of those pieces is going to dominate and you're back to the uh, same situation you had earlier. I would say that the uh, increase in returns of scale or network effects are, are exaggerated as well. Uh, so I don't think that's the, uh, I don't think that's a phenomenon across all tech companies, but it shows up in some cases. I think when you look at Google, I went through our acquisitions. There's a table in, uh, in Wikipedia where you can look this up. And the vast majority of the acquisitions were very small. For example, there were 95 acquisitions that had three or fewer people, which is pretty amazing. But not in Silicon Valley. This is what we call an aqua hire. So when you have an aqua hire, what you're doing is you're acquiring a company, not necessarily for its product, but for its engineers. And uh, Facebook did a lot of aqua hires. Google's done a lot of aqua hires. It's a very, very common uh, phenomenon here. Is there anything that you think could improve competition? Or are there any factors where competition could be improved in the, in the, in the tech world? 
So there's a lot of calls for data portability. And I have to say, I think Google has been a leader in this area. We've been making your data portable for, what, at least uh, six or seven years with uh, Google Takeout. So you could download all your email, you could download all your photos, you can download your web history, you can download your location here, history, whatever. More than 70 databases about you can be downloaded uh, to your computer or to a competitor's computer. So we like data portability, and uh, I think it would make things more competitive. Why does Google like data portability? If that's something that gives your competitors a potential leg up, uh, why is it in your interest to do it as well? Because we think we'd be better utilizing that data than our competitors are. <laughs> so the question is, if everybody is required to do this, to, to make their data portable to one degree or another, then the party that uh, thinks they can get the most value from that data is going to find that very attractive. And somebody who thinks they can't do that, they're going to find that not a very attractive solution. Al, we're going to shift gears a little bit, if it's okay, and, and ask you some uh, some questions that maybe a little bit off the topic we've been talking about. Um, if you could hop into your time machine and go back and find the 25-year-old you, or, or if you were speaking to a young economist today, uh, what advice would you would you give either you or that young economist? Let's see. Plastics, I guess, is out. We can't. Do, that's already been used. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> and, that, and that might and, and that might have been pre when you were twenty five. Uh, <laughs> I got the reference. Sergey didn't. <laughs> the graduate, right? Yeah, okay. I got the yeah. reference. Yeah, he thinks about that as that old movie. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I've been very lucky because I got on these trends pretty early uh, myself. I was an undergrad at MIT. I worked my way through college and graduate school uh, doing computer programming where everything was on a card deck and you turned it in and a few hours later you got a printout and saw your stupid bugs and had to go back and <laughs> submit again. So I, so, uh, I uh, did that for many years and I've always had an interest in uh, technology and uh, particularly the economics of technology. So I'd say, kid, you're on the right path. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work out so badly for you. <laughs> no, right. Take a break. Yeah. Well, and 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 maybe maybe you've just covered this, but but tell us why you. It, it sounds like you enjoy what you do. Tell us what's fun about what you do. Well, I'm going to quote a colleague of mine here at Google who also left academia. He said his friend said to him, why did, you, uh, why did you leave the comfort of the university? And he said, well, when do you want to be in Florence during the Renaissance? <laughs> That's a good answer. I mean, here we are. This is Florence. This is the Renaissance. It's quite an exciting place to be. And, well, I, I, a slightly different topic. How, tell us something unusual or, or different about yourself that, that we wouldn't know if we only knew you professionally. <laughs> Good question. Well, I grew up. Uh, I grew up in an orchard. I'm one of that two percent of Americans who uh, grew up on farms, and that was a little apple orchard in in Ohio. Uh, we made uh, we grew apples, peaches, plums, pears, strawberries, raspberries, and sold them to Smuckers, the jam and jelly people who were just right down the road. That so sounds that like a my, uh, that was my early days. It sounds like a world that is very far away from high tech and computer science. What drew you to computer science? Yes, well, you know, I've been looking into that because there's a great deal of interest in harvesting food crops by robotics. And what happens is, if you think it, think of how we've automated agriculture, wheat, corn, soybeans, barley, all that stuff could be harvested by machinery because it doesn't really have to have a very gentle touch. <laughs> but if you look at the soft fruits, the kind I was just talking about, the apples, peaches, plums, and so on, they have to be very gentle with respect to their harvesting. And that's what's being developed on the robotic side. So the orchard of today is totally different than the orchard that I grew up in 40, 50 years ago. And does Google have any uh, part in that as well? Or is that somebody else working on that entirely? Well, we do have a robotics group, and they're trying to deal with this touch issue of trying to have a touch that's similar enough to human touch that you can utilize it in these applications. I don't know if anybody's looking at specifically agricultural 
uh, applications here. Well, now, Hal, we have a segment on the show we'll call The Curious Hat, where if you were in studio, you would get to reach into the hat and pick out a random question and oh, answer gosh. it. We will do the picking out of the question for you, but let's see what we have here. And now it's time for The Curious Hat. <laughs> All right. Our curious hat question is, what is your perfect weekend? <laughs> perfect weekend. That's a good one. Um, I guess what's fun is to get together with friends, go out and have dinner, have some exciting conversations. Well, weekend, weekend with friends is a uh, is big deal for me. Now, when was the last time you did that? We actually did that just just a few week, uh, weeks ago. Uh, we got together with some uh, some of our some of my longtime friends from graduate school and had a, had a very nice uh, dinner. All right. Well, thank you very much, Hal. We appreciate being here. That does it for this episode of our Curious Amalgam. We will see you next time. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by the ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent those of their employer or other organization. If you like what you heard and would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org slash antitrust. If you have suggestions for topics or are interested in participating in a future episode, please reach out to us at Our Curious Amalgam at AmericanBar.org. Until next time, thank you for listening.